Hey, Pamela. Hey, Fraser. How's it going? It's going well. Do we have an audience out there? We do have an audience. You know, it's strange now that we have put up the show, the, the screen, and we take our time to put everything together. It feels very non-panicked now, very calm. See, it's very non-panicked and calm on your side. I barely get everything posted before you're you, like, ready, ready. Do you need more time? <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> so I, for anyone who, who missed it last night, we had a crazy event. Uh, epic. It was epic. epic. It really was epic, yeah. Phil, I guess Phil, you know, Bad Astronomy Phil, started recording uh, a Q&BA, his questions in Bad Astronomy answers uh, thing that he does, and he was doing live coverage of the eclipse, and uh, he got his timing a little off, so yeah. he started doing his recording about an hour and a half before the partial eclipse was going to be visible on the on the west coast of the United States and in Canada, and so he was sort of filling a lot of time talking about the stuff from from the Pacific, and then uh, I guess we jumped in uh, about an hour and a half into the recording, and we had Scott Lewis, one of our, one of the team from our virtual star party, who had these amazing views of the eclipse from uh, from California, and then we all stuck on, and then Nicole. Gallucci joined us, and, uh, and, and Jason Major, and we were sharing photographs, and uh, I think at the, at the peak of this, we had about 1,700 people watching and, and speaking with us, so if you want to dig that up, that's in Phil's feed. It was, it was a really good time. And, and it will be going into Astrosphere vids. We're cutting it up into one-hour segments so that it's, <laughs> it's easier to handle. I don't know if anyone's going to want to watch the archive or, you know, maybe cut out the one minute of really beautiful <laughs> footage of the, of the eclipse. I think it's a little, uh, a little too much silliness to handle at one, uh, in one meal. So. Yeah, I, I think the last hour is okay. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing about this. I mean, you know, do we want to try and come up with something really slick and polished and well presented, or do we just want to just be silly and and talk about the eclipse? And I don't know. I don't know. It's a it's a it's a weird time as we move yeah. into this new technology with with any everybody and anybody being a broadcaster and our sort of philosophy with Astronomy Cast is that, that real human voices talking about these kinds of topics are very interesting to people, and that's why I think we have a, a big following with the yeah. show. And so the question then is, does that translate into video? I don't know. Well, I, I think the part that really did work was when we started getting photo after photo coming in, and then we were sharing those out. So, so we're going to try this again for the Venus Transit in a couple of weeks. And so what yeah. we're, we're telling you now, audience out there listening, is... Um, we're going to be online. We're going to be trying to stream our own video as best we can. But we want your photos. So share them with us over Twitter. Share them with us over Google+. Email them directly to Fraser at info at universetoday.com. And what we'll do is not just bring you the science explanation, but we'll be sharing the images out. Because in a way, that's really part of the awesome group experience of this. I, I loved all the images we were getting of the eclipses coming through through leaves, of of people yeah. projecting in an artistic ways, and and we want to we want to be able to share out that group experience that we're all able to to have. Yeah, I totally agree. It was it was a really good time, and uh, I would definitely be doing it again. So, um, well, let's uh, get on with today's recording. That that sounds good. And, uh, and as always, uh, if you have any questions for us during the show, go ahead and post them into the comments box on either the Google Plus where, where you can be watching this over on, on, uh, so, so on the Google Plus stream. I think the official one is the one that ends in 6JQ. So, so that's the one where theoretically comments should be piling up. Uh, you can also, there's, I know this is being simulcast over on the uh, Universe Today uh, a strong, uh, sorry, the University Today YouTube channel, so you can ask questions there, and I'll try and watch for that. And finally, you can ask us any questions with the hashtag uh, CQX and hashtag Hangout. And uh, really, the CQX will get you there, but CQX if you can hang out as well, other people will find the Hangout. Yeah, so the CQX is is, is what you're going to want. And so if you use the CQX, then then we'll spot that, and we'll try and synthesize that. in. you can ask us questions about what we're talking about today, or offer us any any you know, suggestions, questions, comments, whatever, or you can just ask us any questions you want, whatever, and uh, we will stick around and, and answer them after the show. Right. So uh, we'll get right into the show now. Sounds great. Um, okay. And we're still madly catching up, so... Uh, um, Stay tuned. 
Stay, stay tuned. Well, I just threw a whole bunch of ideas at Pamela, so you can you can let us know what you think as well. Um, should I give them the, the topics, or do you want to vet them first? Do you have I'll vet opinion? them first. Okay. All right. <laughs> you don't want people to vote. No. <laughs> all right. Uh, was it uh, magneto solar dynamics? I believe. Yeah. No. We're do. Magneto hydrodynamics. <laughs> yeah. Hydrodynamics. Yeah. Yeah. And we're gonna do the math on that. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, cool. Are you ready to press record? I'm ready to press record. Okay, I am pressing record, and it's recording in mono. I got it all right. Good, and I'm also recording, and it's working perfectly. So, uh, cool. let's rock. Astronomy Cast, episode 261 for Monday, April 16th, 2012. The technology... Sorry, i got to do it again, because <laughs> I broke down the wrong title. <laughs> oh, let's try that again. Bloopers. Bloopers, real... Do you want to restart the recording? Uh, I think I will, yeah. Okay. Rewrite my title. Masers in Astronomy. I wrote the description, but I didn't actually... Anyway, I'll be all right. Copy and paste fail. Copy, paste, fail. That's exactly it. Um, okay. Sorry, guys. All right, I'm ready. You ready? Okay, yep. I'm pressing record, and I it's recording. Okay, here we go. Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 261 for Monday, April 16th, 2012. Lasers and Masers in Astronomy. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of University Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Everestville. Hi, Pamela. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? doing really well and I think once again I want just to remind people that if you want a really cool way that you can enjoy Astronomy Cast wherever you are in any way uh, to check out our Astronomy Cast app on the iTunes store. It's $1.99 and then gives you a sort of direct feed to every episode of Astronomy Cast on demand. So you don't have to have them filling up your uh, local drive. You can just you can just play them, stream them directly from our server in whatever episode you want. You can go back, listen to the old episodes, the new episodes, or like my children, you can just leave it on from the time they go to bed and it just keeps running all the way through till morning, burning our batteries. So, And, uh, and kudos to Fraser, so I have to give him a shout out because he went through and he cleaned up all the content. So it's much improved. If you've looked at it before and gone, Ew, yeah, it's fixed now because of yeah, Fraser. He's yeah, awesome. I went through and did all the titles and, and then uh, I could see people kept saying, like, what? you guys got to fix the titles in the old shows and I kept... And, like, and finally, I downloaded it and looked at it. I'm like, oh, I see what people are driving yeah. at. <laughs> I see the problem here. And so then I went through and, and fixed them all. So, yeah. And, and now, you know, we'll try and improve it even some more and try and put in more cool stuff into it. So, so anyway, if you've got an iPhone, uh, sorry, Android people. I guess we'll talk Not there yet. Soon. Not there yet. Um, but if you've got an iPhone, then $1.99, uh, it's the best thing you'll ever buy, ever. Maybe. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get rocking with today's show. Um, so last week we introduced the science of lasers and masers, and this week we apply that knowledge to our favorite field, astronomy. Learn how naturally forming masers teach us about the cosmos and how the artificially produced lasers help us gather better science. So just a quick recap, last week we talked about how uh, lasers are this concept of coherent light that is produced by, uh, I guess, excited electrons being connected in a kind of coherent it, fashion? It's, it's induced emission. Induced. So you have you have an electron gets excited to a higher energy level. Sometimes it gets excited to many higher energy levels and cascades down and settles to a higher energy level. And along comes a photon with a wavelength that has an energy identical to the jump between ground state and the excited state. And as it comes along, at the exact resonant frequency, it causes that excited electron to, dr to drop down and to generate a photon that is, is in sync with the, the photon that caused the simulated emission. Simulated and, emission. And, and we also covered the naturally forming version of the laser, which is the maser. And well, actually, we talked about the technology of the, the technology laboratory of the, microwave. We, we did mention that they've been discovered naturally in science yeah. too, but but I guess the the point is is that a maser is a is can, can be generated by nature, not just in the lab in, in the lab. Right. So okay, so then let's talk a bit. Of, let's go back a bit and talk about the discovery of masers as a natural occurring phenomenon. When did did astronomers first start to discover that there are actually masers out there in the universe? 
Well, this happened in the 1960s. It actually happened, um, it, it was understood that it was happening after we'd been able to, to create them in the laboratory. So it, it was in 1965 that, that Weaver saw these really strong emission lines and um, it was at a frequency of 1665 megahertz. So, so this is a radio frequency. And, and people were still trying to put together the fact that molecules can exist in space. I, I actually, it's one of those things where you sort of look back and you're like, why didn't we think that? And um, for, for reasons that leave me somewhat baffled, for a long time, as astronomers just didn't think you could have molecules in space. And um, th this was at that point where we were still figuring this out. And so they, they saw this wavelength at 1665, and they named it Mysterium. Um, so they didn't know <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, I kid you not. Oh, they that's didn't know amazing. what it was. And oh, it, why is it not still called that? Because <laughs> it was the mystery was well, solved. Well, because it turned out that it was just OH. It was just the, the stuff that makes alcohol interesting. Um, <laughs> so it was the OH molecule. Um, and it, it was attributed to, to coming from molecular clouds, which, which are these, um, we see them as dusty, dark regions in the sky where stars are forming. Um, it, was, it was later found in, in 1969 that there was, was water molecules and they went on to find CH3OH in 1970 and silic silicon oxate in 1974. So just over the years we found more and more and more of, of these extremely bright radio sources that are extremely small. And um, when it comes to trying to figure out how you create something bright and small in radio, that, that was its own um, bit of, of <laughs> perplexing stuff. Um, and, and as people tried to figure it out, they realized the only thing that could be small enough and energetic enough to, to be producing such a bright emission line was a maser. And, and so they had already, at this point, created masers in the lab. Yes. And so then when they saw these emissions out in space, it matched the, the characteristics of what they produced in the lab. But, it, but it, not too far apart. I mean, we, we talked last week that, right. that masers had only really been developed probably, what, 10 years before that? Yeah. So, so this, this was all a fairly new discovery. People were still working to figure it out. And when they first found them in space, it was extremely confusing because to, to build a laboratory maser or laser, you have some sort of a resonant chamber and, and you have all sorts of things that force everything to be coherent and it's, it's often a high pressure system. Um, space isn't like that. And, and so people had to do some really hard thinking about what would cause this. Um, just the idea of, of a population inversion required some hard thinking. So, so here on Earth, when, when you have a gas, in general, the, the particles in the gas are constantly colliding with one another. And as they do this, they're, they're distributing energy f between one another. And all of these collisions cause the gas to be in what we call thermal equilibrium. This is where you can describe um, the velocity distribution of the atoms or molecules in, in a specific mathematical way. And when you have a gas that's in thermal equilibrium, by definition, you don't ever have the energy inversion that you have to have in order to have a laser or maser. What, what I mean by inversion is if you look at the different energy levels, you have a greater population of the electrons in the excited energy level than in the lower energy level. If you didn't have this inversion, what would end up happening is um, as that, that emission is, simulate, is, is stimulated, um, the, the emitted photon would very quickly get absorbed somewhere else and you'd have more absorptions going on than emissions. And if there's more absorptions than emissions, the light doesn't really escape as an emission line. So, so you have to have the, this inversion of, of where the electrons are located. Well, in space, you, you 
don't have thermal equilibrium all of the time. What ends up happening is you have these extremely diffuse gas clouds where <laughs> the atoms just don't ever collide into one another. The molecules just don't really collide into one another. And if they do, the collisions are so infrequent that you're able to have um, non-thermal equilibrium more often than not. And uh, the rule of probability says you're, you're likely to have an inversion just as much as you're likely to have a non-inversion of the energy levels. Right. We've talked about that a bit in the past, right, where you can have situations where you've got gas clouds that are millions of degrees. Yeah. But in fact, you could fly your spaceship right through them, and it's not like no they would be deal. melting the hull of your spaceship. <laughs> it's just that they, the, the individual particles have enough energy that it's the same as if they were millions of degrees hot. And yes, if right. you had it in one small area, that would be very hot gas. But the fact is, is you've got this diffuse gas. So, so not a problem. Um, so, so looking out across space, we, we are seeing these extremely bright, extremely small sources of emission. And as they're trying to map these things out, so OK, we, we can understand where the temperature inversion, the, not the temperature inversion, the, the energy inversion that's necessary comes from. It's just not in thermal equilibrium. So, so the next thing that we have to sort out that, that allows masers and lasers to exist is how do you get all of the light coherent? We, we talked last week about how when you're dealing with a laser, one, one technique, for instance, is um, you only allow the light to come out one end of the laser, and so that tends to get momentum going in one direction. Momentum's not scientifically being used here, it's figuratively being used. Um, so you're, a, you're able to basically, by having mirrors around the, the sides of the cylinder and one end of the cylinder, um, direct all of this induced um, simulated emission, stimulated emission to come out one end of the laser. Well, in, in space, we don't exactly have cylindrical mirrored chambers generating natural masers. So the question comes, how do you end up with, with the nice coherent light? And it turns out magnetic fields play a very important role where it's, it's actually the magnetic fields are polarizing the light, lining up the electro electric and magnetic fields of the photons, getting all of this uh, st stimulated emission going um, in, in a coherent way through space. And so they, so sort of just to understand, I mean, you know, we've seen all these pictures of electromagnetic fields surrounding like the Earth or the Sun or yeah. even just bar magnets, and you've got these magnetic field lines. And, and a good, another good example is like look at the Sun where you see right. sunspots and you get these amazing, you know, magnetic field line loops. And then you've actually got these, these cylinders of gas that are going from one... Um, uh, from, from one sunspot to the next one yeah. with the magnetic field acting like a, almost like a piece of fiber optic, you know, channeling the, the, the gas and then these things twist up and then snap and release yeah. the things. So you can see there's lots of situations out in the universe where magnetic fields act like that, that's, as you mentioned, that cylinder, a, a capturing device, right? Is that right. what we've got going on here? Well, it, it's not so much capturing it, it's just making just sure, holding it well, it, lining it up, lining the little soldiers up, basically. So, so if you've ever played with a bar magnet and iron filings, you've seen all the magnetic field lines that you can get. Well, it, it's not lining it up quite like the way the magnetic field lines are lining up the iron filings, but th that starts to get you thinking in the correct idea. So, so what ends up happening is, is the magnetic field of the stars is capable of helping to polarize the light. So, so you have the electromagnetic fields lined up. Um, you, you have the, the stimulated emission is, is causing new, new light being released to, to line up coherently with the last light released. And all of this adds together to allow very small localized areas around stars, around active galactic nuclei, in some cases even around comets, to, to have a mission that is coherent and acts in every possible way, like a laser or a maser. And so what are the different flavors that we see of these, of these beams? And, and beam is the right way to describe it? Um, it I, I wouldn't go quite that far. It, it's not a coherent beam like a laser that you use to torture your cat. Um, you, you can actually... By, by shining it on the ground and letting your cat chase it, right? That's <laughs> right. how you torture your cat, to entertain it to, until it's tired. 
Well, it, it, it's not, the frustration of a failed hunt. I not mean, never, right. Okay, fine. Yeah. Speed in catching the laser yeah. beam. I'm just saying that we're not torturing a cat by shooting a high-powered laser at the cat for science. No, 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 no. No, that's true. Uh, that's true. No, we're yeah. we're simply. That's all I'm saying. I just want to clarify your yes. clarify your <laughs> definition of cat torture. Um, so right. So then I guess what are we seeing? You know, when we make these observations, so we're not seeing this great big laser beam. Right. Stuck, yeah. No. So uh, so what? Black hole right at us. Right. <laughs> what what we're seeing is. Um, Pockets of gas, a, a, a star forming region or the area around an old star is a great example. So you, so you have the star in the center, it's, it's partially responsible for the magnetic field, um, it's surrounded by uh, gas that is, is being ionized by the star, and within this, this surrounding material you have regions of different temperatures. As you move away from the star things cool off. And so at different distances, you'll actually get different molecules excited uh, depending on, on what temperature they need. Um, then you see also within these regions, materials are moving at different velocities. So in order to get macing to occur, masers to be observed, macing causes masers. Um, in order to get macing to occur, you have to have a pocket of material that is all at the same velocity, so Doppler shifting doesn't cause that that induce that inducing photon to have the wrong wavelength. Right, they need um, to be connected on that front. Right, and and you have to have a pocket that's all the right temperature to to allow the um, inversion of energy levels to occur. So when we look at the gas and material molecular material surrounding uh, both young stars and very old stars, we end up seeing these different temperature regimes moving out. And what's kind of awesome is in the case of, of old stars that are somewhat unstable and, and tend to pulsate, we can use the very long baseline array, the set of radio telescopes that can span the entire width of the planet basically. Using these very uh, long baselines we can get extraordinarily good resolution on the sky and we're able to see that these little macing sources are, are moving and we're able to see that they move in and out as the star itself pulsates. And, and this is an awesome way to start to get scale measurements of different regions just using geometric arguments. Yeah, well, this is my next question is what do we use this stuff for? What do astronomers use these masers? Now that they can detect them, I'm sure they, beyond just detecting them, they want to use them for something. Right. So, so what's, what's awesome about them is, is since we can't go into space with the thermometer and stick the thermometer into the gas cloud, especially when the gas cloud is extremely diffuse, um, what we can do is look for macing activity. We know the very precise energy levels that each of these different um, energy jumps takes place at. And so we're able to, to get a sense of what is the density of the material, what is the region based on variability that we see, what is the size of the region that's macing. Um, and, and then we can also start to measure the sizes of things uh, using a variety of different arguments. So, so for instance, we see these things in some cases what are called mega masers around active galactic nuclei. Wow, I love that name. So, so we, we basically have systems that are tens to hundreds of thousands of times more powerful than the masers that are created in the environments of stars. So that's just kind of crazy to think about. And, and we're able to, to track the rotation of, of the disks of material that they exist in and we're finding that unlike the outer parts of galaxies, these internal disks of material have what's, what's called Keplerian motion. This means that the uh, distance that you are from the center of the disk is proportional to the rate at which you're moving in a way that Kepler's equations allow you to describe mathematically. And, and by knowing how heavy the, the supermassive black hole is in the center of that, and by measuring how fast these masers are zipping around, we, we can start to measure the size scale of, of these accretion disks um, and get the distance to the, the active galactic nuclei. So this is a check on our understanding of distance scales in, in the universe where instead of relying just on Doppler shifting of, of how fast the recession velocity of that AGN is, we, we can instead go, okay, so I know how big the black hole is, I know how far away the maser is, I see how far they appear located on the sky, let's do angular stuff. 
Right. Anything, so, you know, temperature, size, motion, any other things that we can use them for? Well, I mean, clearly they, they tell us what molecules are out there, which is kind of awesome. What things are made of, right, itself. so composition, yeah. And, and it, they're just kind of cool. I mean, it, it's, it's space with lasers. Lasers, lasers, yeah. Now, how far up the electromagnetic spectrum will the, the light go? There, there's actually been some stars that, that we've been able to identify some just within the optical wavelengths lacing, in this case, uh, behavior taking place. But in general, we're looking out in, in the, the radio wavelengths that you could almost get with your car radio, not quite. Right, and, and in infrared, in the long infrared. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's kind of exciting. So, it, yeah. so you've got a star that's generating a laser at the almost at the red end of the spectrum, yeah. but it's just you know, and although the the wavelengths are all lined up in this kind of coherent fashion, it's not being focused like a coherent beam. So it's not like there's a star out there with a great big red laser. No, no. And one of the things that I think has been most interesting to to look at the history of this is is from when we first started discovering these things. People didn't know that the remote molecular People didn't know there were molecules in space. So you start from not even knowing there's molecules right, in space. Just mysterium. To, That's all there right, is out mysterium. there. Right, yeah. um, mysterium. To realizing, oh, there's OH, and, and there's water, and, and there's all this other stuff with, with increasing complexity. To now we're realizing that if you leave molecules alone in a magnetic field, they're going to mace. And, and so that's the other thing that these things are tracing is, is where there's magnetic fields. And we're, we're finding them in neat places. Like even in supernova remnants, you'll end up seeing masers where the shock wave of the expanding material hits the, the um, interstellar media. And, and there's, there's charged particles in motion. There's magnetic fields being generated. And all of this leads to masing activity. That is really cool. Well, before we run out of time, I want to switch to the, the other technology, which is the lasers, and not necessarily how we're discovering them out in space, right. although I still want to find that star with a great big red laser zapping out of it, but, um, but how humans are generating lasers for use in, in astronomy. And I know there's sort of two interesting ones that we can talk about, and there's a bunch more, but, but one is using them for distance, right? We, we know how far away the moon is. Right, so so there's laser, uh, basically laser ranging. This is the same thing that cops do when they're getting ready to give you a ticket if you're misbehaving while driving down the road. Um, so so the idea is you can bounce the la a laser off of something, measure its distance, and if you bounce a laser off of something, you and and you do this over a period of time, you can get velocity both from the, the initial distance and the secondary distance, and also from the Doppler shifting of the light that's coming back at you. Um, so we don't deal with the Doppler shifting with the moon quite so much, but we do get its distance down to millimeters by using pulsed laser light and measuring how long it takes the, those pulses to return, and that's just cool. But partly thanks to the fact that, that the humans landed on the moon and carefully placed these retro reflectors yeah. on the surface of the moon, which then reflect a, a big portion of the laser light that, that's blasted at the moon as opposed right. to, I guess, I don't, I don't know whether you would, I'm sure the laser range finding would still work to some degree if you didn't have these reflectors but on the moon. I but mean, at the end of the day, you waste fewer photons, and they're literally counting one, two, four photons coming back. It's a lot of light gets lost in the process. Right, right. And I always describe that as sort of my favorite, one of my favorite reasons to know that, that humans did make it to the moon, which is the fact that we can point a laser and the laser will bounce off of these reflectors. And there's no way that that wouldn't work if you didn't have those reflectors up on the moon. So we determined the distance to the moon. I know with accuracies, sub-centimeter accuracies, I mean, we know but really millimeters. millimeters. We know exactly where the moon is at and, all and times. What is awesome, not sneaking up on us now? This 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 concept of lunar laser ranging made it into an episode of Big Bang Theory, and it it's so funny because what they did, the mathematics, the physics, all of that works, but they're doing it with this little tiny telescope and a small laser, and the people who are doing this for real, they're using a 30 inch telescope and they're using an extremely powerful green laser. Um, they're actually using the mirror of the telescope to send the laser beam out, and um, yeah, so, so right concepts wouldn't have actually worked. 
Right, right. Um, but now, are, are we range finding other things in the solar system? Well, yeah, but we generally tend to use other wavelengths to do it. I, again, we, we end up jumping down to the radio. So, so Goldstone uh, radio radar facility was one of the first ways that we were measuring the distances to Mercury, to Venus, to Mars, to asteroids, and that was by shining radar, radio light, off of other nearby objects. So it's just a matter of jump around the electromagnetic spectrum until you find a friendly energy and wavelength for what you're trying to do. And then the other and just incredible application of lasers is in adopt adaptive optics. Right. So, right. so in this case, for adaptive optics, ideally what you want is a nice bright star in your field of view. And you look at how that bright star moves, changes from looking spherical to looking crazy shaped. And you flex your mirror to, to compensate for all the things the atmosphere is doing to that starlight. Now the thing is, not every field of view has a bright star in it. But we can create bright stars by shining lasers at just the right wavelength that they excite parts of the atmosphere to ionize. So, so when we do laser guiding, what we're actually doing is exciting upper levels of the atmosphere to, to emit light that, that we're then studying. And then, um, just I mean, just the technology that these great big mirrors can be modified in real time to yeah. react to the atmospheric distortions is still just absolutely mind-bending. Ha have you ever seen like a video, or have you actually seen this in person? Where yeah, I got to see the Wynn Observatory in person, and it's this giant honeycomb mirror with actuators all over it. And, it's and they're like little little pistons just kind yeah. of pushing on the, on the mirrors, yeah. right? And then, and then the mirror just kind of flexes up and down a little bit. How fast do they go? I it, it depends system to system, but, but they're looking at sub-second scales in some cases. So these little pistons are just distorting the shape of the mirror in yeah. fractions of a second with hundreds of actu actuators? Thousands? It, again, it depends. depends on the not depends thousands, on the, but yeah, yeah, but hundreds, yeah, yeah. And so you can imagine making these tiny little distortions in the mirror. It's a phenomenal technology, and is. But I guess the point being, way cheaper to take a t great big telescope, put in all these little actuators, fire a laser into space, into space, than to launch it into space and get above the atmosphere. Although if you did get above the atmosphere, then it would be an even better telescope. So. But but I mean, the thing about keeping things on the ground that people tend tend to not think about is if it's on the ground, you can do experiments on your telescope. You can say. I'm not sure if this will work. I'm going to try this filter and this other thing. And that sort of, of learning in real time, we call it engineering time in the telescope. You get four nights. You don't know if you're going to get science out of them. But you're going to try a, a new instrument. Right. That sort of engineering you, you can't do on orbit currently. Yeah, or you bring your own instrument that you're, you work yeah. with a research group and you bring it to the observatory and you slot it into the telescope right. in the CCD and gather science in a way that maybe no one had tried before and you won't yeah. know if it's going to work or not until you do it. So no, absolutely. So are there any other applications of lasers in astronomy? Communication, I guess, with uh, spacecraft. Well, so so the the other big thing is is interferometry to tell the differences dif to tell the distances between two spacecraft. So there there's a variety of different systems. Uh, Grail, which is orbiting the moon, is, is one of the more famous ones, where you have spacecraft that are lacing the distance between the two of them, and by measuring using interference patterns, how that distance changes, they can see how gravity is pulling on one before it pulls on the other to, to accelerate them and decelerate them in their orbits. Uh, we also see uh, with the, the laser interferometry projects, we have LIGO on the Earth. Right. Someday maybe we'll build LISA, maybe. Um, <laughs> so uh, this, this is projects where, where we're very carefully measuring the separation between two points on the ground. Um, by looking at lasers interfere. I mean, that, that's the awesome thing is this, this is coherent light with the, the wavelengths of the different photons happily lined up with one another as they, they, they don't actually swim. That's me trying <laughs> so to imitate. They, they, are, they, are, they form some kind of, uh, yeah, a wave. Um, yeah. Uh, so, well, you know what? This is great, Pamela. Thanks a lot. And I think we have two takeaways for today that I think if anyone can walk away with two concepts in their head, I think everyone should remember Mysterium does not exist. And mega mazers. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and there are molecules in space. And there are molecules in space. Well, that was great, Pamela. Thank you very much, and we'll Thank see you. you next week. Okay. Pausing the recording, actually stopping and saving the recording. And we will look for your questions as soon as we're done saving. And I'm actually going to close GarageBand so I can have my CPU back. Yeah. Abandon GarageBand. <laughs> I did not. You must. But I use iMovie to do stuff. And when you use iMovie to do stuff, it's just friendly. Uh, <laughs> Clay Kavanagh says, Godzilla vs. Mega Mazer. <laughs> I love it. I, that's a movie I'd watch. We need that T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, Godzilla vs. Mega Mazer. It's too. It's a. It's a pretty in joke. I think at this point. Um, but yeah, go ahead and ask any questions that you might have uh, about this, about the eclipse, about the upcoming uh, transit of Venus hangouts. Has everyone's got access to Google Plus Hangouts now? So yeah. So I don't know what what impact that's been having. Today it was okay, thankfully. I think people yeah. are finally getting bored with having access, and we have our servers back. Yeah, yeah, all the. Slightly lined up is is you it, it's a system literally there's a mirror where you're flipping back and forth between sending laser up the tube of the mirror or receiving photons down the tube of the mirror so it's it's just coherent I'm asking answering questions in the, in the comment so we were talking about uh, the server crashing and then the server crashed irony we we had a moment of irony um, now I don't know if, if this is going to work if, do people say that they can see it um, I'm refreshing. Um, was it real or was it Memorex? Feed cut up out just as you said that server was great. Um, oh, I'm seeing people say, uh-oh, I don't know if we came back. Hello, let us know if we came back. I see you, Taylor Crow wrote. Yes, Jeff says, I see it okay, now. Okay, we're back. Cool. Right, good. Um, what were you talking about? Um, I was answering Dave. Dave Regan wrote in the comments, why use a telescope to send a laser beam to the moon? Um, and he says some other things. And he, his thing is, is there a, a better alignment for the return? Is that the only reason? I said pretty much yes. So, so what happens at places like McDonald Observatory where they do lunar laser ranging is, is you have normal reflecting telescope. Um, and, and it's a schmidt cassegrain telescope. So light comes in the top of the telescope. So let me actually do tube sideways. So light comes in the top of the telescope, hits a mirror at the back. It's reflected up to a secondary mirror, reflected down through a hole in the end. And when it comes through the hole in the end, if you're in detection mode, there's a CCD there. But there's a mirror that allows them to flip back and forth between detecting things with the CCD and shining a laser through the system. And, and basically, by flipping the mirror back and forth, it can go from sending laser, which is just kind of awesome, and on a dusty night, you'll actually see laser through the sky, yeah. um, to, to detecting the, the light returning from, from bouncing off of the moon, from asteroids, from satellites. They lace lots of different things. Right. Do you have any more questions? This is your chance about anything. Um, oh, we came back. So uh, Bridget wants to know, uh, when we talk about molecules in space, is this between stars, galaxies, and anything else, and how did they get there? So, so I mean, if we're talking about molecules, then did they, did they form in stars? I mean, the carbon and all that would have had to form in stars, right? Not necessarily. So, well, the atoms, the individual yeah, atoms. Yeah, the atoms would. Stars. And then so, they so would come together. The, the history 
of, of the molecules is, so originally the universe was hydrogen and helium with trace amounts of lithium and beryllium, go listen to our Big Bang show. Um, but, but over the billions of years, we, we've had um, elements created in stars. So you end up with, with elements up through lead, basically, created, um, sorry, you end up with elements up to iron, basically, uh, created in um, normal stars. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen all come from sun-like stars, for instance. And as the stars die and puff off their atmosphere, they, they distribute these atoms through space. And in some cases, you also have other what are called S-process atoms. These are things that are created through the slow capture of neutrons also form in the atmospheres of stars. So you end up with a few random heavier elements. Um, but all the really heavy stuff, so gold, silver, things like that, are formed in supernova explosions. So all these atoms get distributed through space. And they end up gravitationally clumping up in clouds. And within those clouds, over the age of the universe, very slowly, you sometimes end up with with different atoms coming close enough together that they're able to bond into more and more complex molecules. We, we've found buckyballs, we've found chlorofluorocarbons, we've found all sorts of crazy giant molecules. And at a certain point, they go from being molecules to being dust grains. And, and so one of the neat things is, is just how big can a dust right. grain get? Dust grains, rocks, asteroids, mm -hmm. planets. I mean, there's some really interesting research that's been coming out about about the, there may be a large number of rogue planets in the in the the Milky Way in the galaxy, and you know they could have formed in various ways. Some you know in you know just as failed failed stars, right? But you know you could imagine these great big dust clouds that slowly accrete together into these just planety things. Well, and and this is where we we have to look at. In general, gas, gas pressure is capable of supporting the cloud from collapsing down. And, and so there's this balancing point between the temperature of the gas that holds it up and the gravity of the gas collapsing it down. And once you get enough mass to go past that stability point, everything collapses gravitationally. But most clouds are quite entirely happy to support themselves just, just off of their temperature. Right, right. Uh, and that's why you really want the cold gas to, to do it. Well, um, this, and this is where cold gas is where you see all of the molecules. Now, Christopher King mentioned earlier on in the recording that it was great to see Pamela on the universe. So what, what, what happened? You were on television? Last night. Yes. So, so the irony of ironies, to add irony to our day, is I was on TV last night on a channel I don't get. So I, I haven't actually seen it yet. No. Um, so, so I uh, recorded with the director, Colin Campbell, who does science science for the universe. I recorded an episode a few months ago called Deep Freeze. And it aired last night, and it talks about um, the citizen science project that we were running at the time called Ice Hunters, which has since morphed into there's a new CosmoQuest project, which also went live last night, um, called Ice Investigators, and how everyday people are helping to explore our solar system. Um, it also talks about the coldest places in space, how um, when you freeze different liquids, you end up with fish on top instead of trapped underneath the water, and things like that. Um, it was a blast to film because we filmed it in the City Museum in the city of St. Louis. And if you're ever in St. Louis, go to the City Museum. It, it's a museum of found objects with a 10-story slide. It's awesome. So did you have lots of people congratulating you on something that you haven't seen yet? Yes. It's been very weird. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's a way that you could possibly get your hands on it. You know? I, I, I'm sure. And, there's and, a way. Yes. Um, uh, so Jeff Borst recommends corrective optics should be called pew pew astronomy. I like that. Pew pew lasers. <laughs> um, uh, Jace Pearson asks, question about last night's video with Phil Plate. You guys were talking about getting together to see the 2017 eclipse. Is there yeah. a possibility that all of your brilliant minds putting together an event for anyone to come and watch with you? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, maybe. I don't know. I mean, we were talking about that before. You know, before we actually did the eclipse coverage and Phil had kind of jumped on and was starting to get rolling, you, you and I were both kind of, man, I don't know, what's the best way to, to talk about an eclipse? And in my mind, you know, the best way to present an eclipse is to go and get a really beautiful telescope stream of the eclipse, put it up and 
back he away said the from London the London Philharmonic. And yeah, I back away from that. the computer and and let it fill the screen and maybe get, yeah exactly get the London Philharmonic you know get some classical music to just play and you know in the background quietly and then maybe hit a crescendo when you hit the. Uh, but but I'm now thinking maximum. George Robb and Party in the Park. <laughs> Party in the Park, yeah, a whole bunch of telescopes set up and and uh, yeah that might be the the way to go. So yeah, it would be great. And this is going to be the most monumental eclipse really of our generation. Yeah. So. We should do something for it. So if you want to come, yeah, we'll 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 think of something. We'll I'm get, not, not everyone will fit in my house. I, I'm no. only promising space for Fraser and Phil. But I'm but, sure but there's we a will place. arrange hotels. Yeah, well, I'm sure there's a place somewhere along the path that maybe we can meet up that that would be a good venue for it. Yeah. And I think as we're connecting all the stuff with what we're doing on Google Plus and what we're doing with with our various blogs and so on, we're trying to you know I know Phil's putting together an outdoor event. Yeah. Um, the summer, and we've got the uh, the end of the world cruise that we're going to be participating right. in at the end of the year. Come cruise with us. Come cruise with us. Yeah, if you're interested, come to astrosphere.org, and you'll find some information about the cruise that we're doing. Uh, we're trying to do more of this kind of stuff. Trying gather together the community and do fun things. It's yeah. it's a it's a balancing act that we need to to figure out, and mostly come out of our shells. I mean, really, it's you know you got to put yourself out there and say, okay. Everybody meet here for this thing, and then nobody shows up, and then you feel like an idiot. That's that's the part you want to avoid. And and for those wanting to see us in person this summer, um, I'm going to be at Balticon next weekend in Baltimore. Are you going to come to TAM? Uh, maybe TAM, yeah. yeah. So I yeah. will be at TAM for sure. I'm And I'm probably going to be going to the Penny Arcade Expo. Okay, so, so he'll be at Pax. Penny Arcade yeah. in Seattle. Do you know when that is? No. Uh, okay. August. And yeah, they and all come fast and furious, right? July is TAM. And Pax TAM is August. the amazing meeting. It's in yeah. Las Vegas in July. Yeah. And and if you go to CosmoQuest, you can subscribe to our Google calendars, and we list all of the different events that it'll either be Fraser or me or Nicole Gallucci or, or there's a whole group of us that are now working together. Um, I, I love how we have bad astronomer, bald astronomer, noisy astronomer. Um, we're bringing together yeah. a, a good group of, of people to do great things. Yeah, and it's kind of ironic. You know, we're here on Google Plus right now, but the, but one of the best ways to stay on top of all the stuff that we're doing is through Twitter. So yeah. if you're watching this right now, um, your Star Strider with a Y, yep. Star Strider at, um, on Twitter, I'm Universe Today. Uh, Phil is Bad Astronomer. Uh, Nicole's noisy astronomer. So you know, if you if you want to get the sort of updates, then you'll want to follow us. Our Twitter feeds, yeah. And yeah. CosmoQuest X on Twitter posts all of it for all of us. Yeah. So so that's probably the best way. Um, so one last one last issue here. Oh, you know what? We didn't even talk about uh, in the show. We should talk about lasers redirecting asteroids, but. Yeah, well, that's that's not a done deal yet. It's it's a cool theory, so I feel okay problem. that we left it out. Right. It's all right. All right. When they've moved a, a rock that way, we'll still be recording. We can talk about it then. Sure. So um, Jim, well, and also uh, light sails using a laser to move yeah. a light sail. So that's kind of cool too. Uh, so Jim Comail asks, I seem to remember lasers being used to push a dish-like object, and some hints of its use as a space elevator. Heard of this? Any progress? Um, I haven't so I heard think, about the space elevator. Actually. I think I know what he's talking about. There was a, there was a technology that you would essentially, you would, not an elevator exactly. You would take a uh, train, you would you would put it on like Mount Fuji and or Mount Kilimanjaro, and you would drive it up the side of Mount Kilimanjaro at high speed with some kind of maglev device. And then when it got to the top and launched into off the top of the mountain, you would blast at it with lasers to um, vaporize like ice or water behind it and that would act like thrust that would then fire it off into orbit. That sounds like a bad idea in so many different ways. No way! You have no imagination, Pamela. That's awesome on every scale. It's got lasers and you're flying off mountains with trains and yeah, yeah, I know that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> You don't have to be in it, just, you know. Just <laughs> so, so the idea that, that seems a little bit safer that's out there is, is you have a spacecraft that's flying between the planets with a giant sail, and you shine a laser at the giant sail, and yes. the laser beam, by the time it hits the giant sail, has spread out. And so the laser is on the planet Earth, 
the, the push of the laser on the Earth is not going to move the Earth. The light pressure of the laser will move the sail, and you can basically bounce things between planets this way. What doesn't work is sitting on the spacecraft shining a laser at your own sail, because the pushback on the laser is exactly equal to the push on the sail, so you go nowhere. Have we actually, uh, we haven't, have we ever done a show on solar sailing yet? No, we talked about it in some of the question and answer. So yeah, we should do that. We should do it sometime. Yeah, let's yeah. do an episode on, on solar sailing. I'm going to write that in my big list of ideas. And you'll like that better than my other ideas that I've been giving you. Done. Okay, cool. Well, I think we're kind of reaching the end of our hour, so why don't we wrap this up? Uh, uh, we've, got, we've answered questions. We've uh, gone through technical issues. We've recorded an episode of Astronomy Cast. So now we still have some catching up to do, so don't be surprised if there are more episodes of Astronomy Cast showing up at random times in your feed. Thank you to everyone who is still watching. Thank you very much, Pamela, once again for uh, letting us uh, you know, pick your brain about all things space and astronomy. And uh, what's next? Wednesday, Science Weekly Science Hour? Wednesday is the Weekly Science Hour. This week it's going to be Nicole Gallucci. She's going to be talking about dark skies, bright kids, and other dark skies issues with a group of people from UVA. Awesome. All right. And when, when is that? That is at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, if you subscribe to our newsletter, there is a link to time zones around the world. If you don't subscribe to our newsletter, shame on you. Go set up an account at cosmoquest.org, and you can sign up for the newsletter in the profile setting. Yeah, and if you're philosophically opposed to new email newsletters, then follow, sign us toward, on Twitter. follow us on Twitter, and then you'll get yeah. it. Yeah. Star Strider, Universe Today. Noisy Astronomer, Cosmoquest X. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. We'll see you later. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.